Um, I'm originally from uh, Southeast uh, Missouri. I uh, was born and raised there. Um, my grandparents raised me. They were from uh, Alabama in Mississippi. Uh, my grandmother was born in Alabama in 1911. Uh, my grandfather was born in Mississippi in 1908. Uh, up until the fifth grade, I was raised in Missouri up until the fifth grade. Uh, moved to the south side of Chicago with my mom. Uh, went to a private school on the south side of Chicago by the name of Corpus Christi. Uh, very different, but uh, I think the education uh, that they were providing, the, the education level was a little bit higher, uh, a little bit more strict, and they, the classroom sizes were smaller, so they could. What was that type of school like? Uh, it was a Catholic school, uh, private school, so I had to wear a white shirt, <laughs> a blue tie, and blue pants, and black non-marking shoes, so we wouldn't have, we wouldn't mark up the hallways because they were real pristine. They were, you know, re real clean, you know, glossy. Uh, and I remember one time I, I, I forgot my, uh, we had to wear snowshoes during uh, uh, winter and had to bring our shoes, put them in my backpack, and I forgot my shoes at home, so I had to wear my snow boots in school all day, and the principal, Ms. Lemon, I'll never forget it, Ms. Lemon, uh, <laughs> she gave me one day uh, suspended, she suspended me one day from school, and my mom was like, don't you ever forget your shoes again. It, it, was, it was crazy. But uh, I, really, I really enjoyed it uh, after my eighth grade year. Graduating from eighth grade, I uh, decided to move back uh, to Missouri uh, with my grandparents uh, and went, went to high school there uh, in Missouri. And uh, had a good time. I started out with sports. Um, really wasn't that athletic. I played a lot of basketball and, and when I lived in Chicago. I was okay. I wouldn't. I, I don't think I was good enough to probably get a scholarship or anything, but uh, went to high school there. And I remember one day, uh, and I think this is really what defined or where I started thinking about uh, the military. I was a National Guard unit around the corner from my house. And I remember we had like a, it was a um, job, not a job fair, but a, what do they call those? Uh, not a job fair, where people come and they talk about their professions and career stuff. Day. Career day, yeah. And they were talking about college. And I was like, man, so I go home and I call my mom and I'm like, hey, you know, I think I want to go to college. And they were talking about college funds. I didn't know what college fund was. So I went, to, went home that day, called, called my mom, said, hey, you know, uh, we had this career day. And uh, they were talking about college. Do you have a college fund for me? She was like, no, there's no college fund. You got to figure it out. And I was like, wow. And I remember going to the grocery store. There's a grocery store called McLean Foods. I'm going to the grocery store for my mom. And I see this uh, recruiter office, this recruiter going into this National Guard building. And I was like, man, let me go over there and talk to him. And I went and talked to him. And I was like, hey, I want to go to college. I don't have any money. My family don't have any money to send me to school. Can the National Guard help? Yeah. And I was planning on doing playing basketball my sophomore year. And I remember thinking, I got to get a part-time job in work so I can save up, to, you know, have money saved up to go to college. And I say, oh, I can do this uh, National Guard thing uh, through school. So a lot of other guys that I was going to high school with, they were doing a National Guard thing. And I decided to stop playing sports uh, for that reason. Because uh, I figured, okay, I'm not going to get a D1 scholarship anywhere. And... Um, I want to go to school, you know. So go through, go through high school. What was unique about high school, my mindset changed. And I had a teacher tell me, oh, you're not going to go past uh, high school. And I was like, wow. And that's devastating to a high school student, at least to me it was. But in a sense, it added fuel to the fire because I was like, you know. You, you know. So it didn't devastate you, it pissed you off. Right, yeah, yeah. So... To go through, I'm going through high school, and I remember I, I was doing a little summer jobs and stuff like that, and uh, it was a school board superintendent, Mr. Backus. Never forget him, Mr. Backus. I had a summer job, and he came to me, and he said, hey, we want you to do this commercial that we're shooting for uh, one of the local uh, TV affiliates. And I was like, okay, cool, you know. 
So I did like a little uh, commercial about the summer school, not, about the, not summer school, but the summer work program that I went through. Uh, and then he offered me, he said, hey, we have a janitor over at the high school that's uh, having a little minor surgery and gonna be out for, for a couple of weeks. Do you mind filling in for him? And we'll pay you. I'm in high school. And he's asking me to be a part-time janitor at the high school. And I did it for a couple of weeks. I asked my grandmother, she said, yeah, I stay after school, got off at 11 o'clock, and then I went to, back to you know, class the next day. Uh, so then, uh, moving forward, I get a job at Pizza Hut, um, delivering pizzas. And I was there uh, for a while, and at the same time, I started the Missouri National Guard. Uh, so I was doing that two, two days a month until I went to basic training. I went to basic training after I finished my junior year of high school. Um, still working at Pizza Hut, come back, and I get another job offer to work at a rental store part-time. So now I'm a senior in high school, and I'm working, I'm getting out of school at noon to go work at the rental store from one to five and, and on Saturdays, and then I go home, take a shower, and then six to 10, I work at Pizza Hut. And then after Saturday, after I worked at the uh, rental store all day Saturday, go home, take a shower, then I work at Pizza Hut four or five hours, and then I would get up Sunday morning and open up uh, the Pizza Hut store, and then Monday, I'm back at school again. So basically, I had three part-time jobs my last year and a half of high school. And after I graduated uh, my, uh, from high school, I go back, I uh, went to Fort Leonard Wood for Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, uh, for basic training, AIT advanced initial training. So after I graduated from high school, about a week later, I'm back uh, finishing up my uh, military training, my AIT training, and I do that. And I remember I applied for college while in AIT, and my drill instructor he's getting these letters from this university. <laughs> he was like, "You got to be freaking, you know, use a couple of." <laughs> yeah, you gotta be kidding me. And, you know, he told me, you know, once I graduated, he's like, hey, man, this, this is good at what you're doing. He said, I never, he said, for you to go through all this and you're applying to school, he said, that's a good thing. Don't let anything stop you. And I did, man. I uh, enrolled in uh, Southeast Missouri State University in the uh, fall of 1988. 88, yeah. And I went there for three years. I set out one semester. Um, ran out of money and uh, went and worked in Chicago with my uncle. He got me a job at a chemical company he was working for at the time. Uh, and then I went back to school, had enough money for about a year, ran out of money again. I said, you know what, I'm not going to sit out another uh, year. I was uh, into my junior year. I just finished uh, my junior year and passed a recruiting station. And I went in and I talked to the Army recruit. I said, hey, I'm in the National Guard. I want to go on active duty. And this was August. In October, I was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, doing my um, uh, reclassification. And I was in the Army. I went in the Army. I uh, uh, got buried a couple months later. Uh, finished the training, went to Germany for three years. Uh, loved it. Loved the people. Uh, met uh, a lot of uh, good people that uh, I worked with uh, in, the, in the military. And I um, was there for three years. I PCS back to uh, Fort Hood, Texas. Never had been to Texas before. <laughs> Never been to Texas before. I uh, was there another three and a half years, and then that's when I uh, exited uh, the, the Army. And uh, what was unique about it, while I was still in the military, I was still continuing my, uh, my education. I didn't stop, uh, and that was a good thing. Uh, and even the soldiers that reported to me, I encouraged them to take college courses. Uh, because it was only going to help them during the military career, and a lot of them, they weren't going to, you know, do 20 years. And I was like, hey, if you plan on going to college after, it definitely just catapults you that far ahead, you know, with your schooling. Uh, so I left. Second, I want to ask yeah. you, what drove this? I mean, you sounded like you knew early on that you wanted an education and continued to prioritize that throughout growing yeah. up. At a young age, uh, 
I would say maybe like four or five, because my grandfather had a third grade education. Uh, he left school in third grade to go work uh, in Mississippi. Uh, he was born in Mississippi in, like I said, 1908. Uh, he had to help feed the family, you know. So imagine, you know, I, I think I had kids, you know, when they were in the third grade, with, you know, them dropping out of school to do some type of work. And he would always tell me, make sure you get your education. Don't be like me. Make sure you get your education. And he would tell me that story. And that always, you know, and my grandmother would say the same thing, uh, but my, grandma, my grandfather said a little bit more. Uh, and he was like, just whatever you do, just make sure you get your education because you could lose certain things. You could lose a car, you could lose your house, you never lose that education. And that's something that nobody can ever take away from you once you have that knowledge. You know, and he was very adamant about that. So I just, I, I think that's what really drove me. And I had friends, you know, I, I got a couple of friends. Uh, one, of my, uh, one friend of mine lives in Kansas City. And I've uh, been knowing him since second grade, I mean the second day of kindergarten. And my other friend I've been knowing him since the third grade, but we all grew up on the same street. We still talk to each other, you know, once, um, twice a week. And, you know, we have conversation. We kind of like, you know, push each other like, hey, you don't need to be doing that. What are you doing? Uh, you haven't finished school yet. You know, you're kind of in the streets. You mess around. You know, so you're just having those friends uh, to push you. And my second semester of college, I joined a fraternity. And um, it, it, when they say it's a, a true brotherhood, it is. Uh, a lot of people think it's just oh, a lot of partying, which we did. <laughs> We did. I did my fair share of partying in, in, in college, but I can remember one of the brothers, and he's actually a lawyer now in uh, St. Louis. He used to fight all the time in college. Always, I was a boxer in St. Louis, and he was just fighting all the time. Now he's a lawyer, you know. But I remember him. He's still fighting. Yeah, yeah, in, in the court, in the court. So, and I can remember him telling me he was like, "Man, you know, your grades are slipping. It, it's fine to party, but you're not here." to party, be in the fraternity and party. You're here to get education and move on. And I was like, wow. I was like, man, you know, so I had another upperclassman, you know, he was like a couple years ahead of me telling me this, you know, it wasn't my father, it wasn't my mother. And so he was saying, you know, the same things that other, you know, friends and other people, you know, in my family were telling me, you know. Uh, so I wasn't bad in college or anything like that. Like I was, I wasn't, you know, always skipping class or nothing like that. But, you know, he just noticed, hey, your grade slip, you got to get it together. You know, um, you're not here just for the fraternity. You're here to get education first. You're a student first. And I was like, man. So even when I left, I felt kind of bad because I didn't, I, I didn't finish something that I started. Uh, so when I got out of the military, I went back to the same university. And within a year, I got my uh, degree. I obtained my degree, and one good thing about that, my grandmother, uh, my grandfather had already passed, but uh, my grandmother, she got to see me uh, graduate. And I can, I can still remember what she was wearing at the graduation, and uh, 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 the speaker, he asked, he was like, how many people here in the military, you know, stand, how many people are graduating, or, you know, some type of affiliation with the military, stand up, and then he asked the audience, he was like, you know, if you are a grandparent, uh, someone that's graduating, a great great parent, you know, stand up. And I can remember seeing my grandmother stand up, and, and we had a little. Uh, the lady I was dating at the time had a uh, a little get together at the. Uh, I had a little duplex, and uh, my grandmother came, and I can remember her telling me she was like, "I'm so proud of you." She was like, "You were the last child that I raised," and it was just, she was just overwhelmed, just you know, telling me that to see me graduate from college was, uh, it was like. Her, her dream uh, come true. So, uh, and I just, I just, you know, I was like, man, you know, it just, it was heartfelt. Uh, uh, you know, there's other people out there with stories, you know, uh, like mine. Um, but, um, you know, having to pay my own way through college, it was tough. Uh, having a little, a lot of, you know, a lot of odd jobs, you know, part time jobs here and there. And then you get, still got to focus on studying. But, you know, like I say, this, my story is not. Like, real, it's unique, but, you know, other people have went through it, 
before me and other people are going through it now, you know. Um, so I go, I graduate college, I was working for this uh, company as a production technician, and I said, man, you know, I'm tired of this, I just graduated from college, <clears throat> get online, get contacted by a headhunter, he was like, hey, I got this supervisor job for Kraft Foods on the south side of Chicago, I'm like, yeah, I'll go for the interview. Went up there, interviewed, got the job. And, you know, I'm working at Kraft Foods at, with they, at their Kool-Aid plant on the south side. So I, uh, the department I worked in, we made shake and bake, open pit barbecue sauce and um, Taco Bell good seasoning uh, in the packets. And then we made the Kool-Aid in the little packets that they opened. We were the only plant that packaged that Kool-Aid and we made Crystal Light. Uh, so I was there. Uh, two years, and then they decided to close the plant. I, you know, I had a lot of good people that I worked with and that worked for me, and I really, that was probably the first time where I had a job where I didn't mind getting up in the morning and going. Even if I was tired, I still went. I had a really, uh, my boss, um, he was, I think he was risen from India, Anil Aurora, I'll never forget him, probably, well, I wouldn't say probably, was the second best supervisor I ever had. The other supervisor I had was uh, in the military. What made him different? He, he pushed education. He was like, I'm going to send you to corporate to do this training. I'm going to send you to corporate to do this training. And I was like, okay. And I couldn't figure out, I knew why, but I'm like, okay. And then when he started assigning me task after that, that training helped, you know, and it helped me throughout my career in the private sector, you know, um, but he pushed, you know, uh, education in, in, the, in that uh, operating environment. Um, and I learned a lot from him, you know, different uh, leadership techniques and stuff like that uh, outside of the military. So I would say he was the second, in the private sector, he was the best boss I ever had, I can say that. In the military, uh, never forget him, Staff Sergeant Washington, Lionel Washington from Dorita, Louisiana. And you see him, man, he was high yellow, had a little black mustache, and he had just came, he had just transferred from Fort Bragg, North Carolina to Germany. And man, he was, he was quiet, he didn't say too much, and he came up to me one day. He was like, hey, you're a little bit different, man. You, you see that you're a couple years older than other guys, a little bit more mature, and I was telling him about uh, education, uh, I was in college before coming in the military and I was still continuing my education. And he was like, well, if you want a soldier, I'm going to teach you how to soldier. No BS, I don't want to hear no nothing. And I was like, okay. And he did that. And in two and a half years, I went from a private to a sergeant. And a lot of it, when you tell people that, and they're like, wow, you were really fast tracking. And I was. Because when I got to Germany, it was guys two or three ranks ahead of me. And when we left, I outranked them. You know, but it was just, again, that education, that willingness to learn. You got somebody wanting to teach you, and I was willing to learn, and that's what I did. So he was probably, he was, I want to say probably, he was um, um, the best supervisor uh, that I had, a section chief that I had while I was in the military. And it, He's the only one I remember. His first and last name. Normally, you call people by last name. Lionel Washington from Dorita, Louisiana. He used to tell me these stories about his mom. He wasn't doing anything. He had this big fro, and he's laying on the couch. And she goes and gets the recruiter, brings him to the house. He's like, there he is. Take him. And I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, that's what my mom did. So I'm laughing. And we, you know, he kind of opened up a little bit. And he was like, why are you taking these courses? And so I kind of shared, I shared the story with him about my grandparents that I just shared. I shared it with him. And he started taking college courses with me. Yeah, and he was like, man, he said, you know, I, I spent 15 years in the military. He was like, man, I, I never took a college course. He's like, I wasted my time. He said, you got me in school. And I was like, when I left, he still had a year left in Germany. He was like, you know, I'm still going to continue um, to go to school. And that was the last time I ever saw him and talked to him, you know. But, it, yeah, yeah. And it's crazy. Yeah, because I'm like, I know where he's from. He's from Dorita, Louisiana. First name, Lionel Washington. He, I mean, really cool. And I remember him telling me, he's like, 
if you want a soldier, and he used to be like, man, I come from Bragg, and he's like, this is what we do it, you know. And he was like, uh, if you want to be a soldier, he said, right now, you're just going through the motions. You get up in the morning, you're going to PT, you know, you're just going through the motions. He's like, you're going to learn your job, you're going to get physically and mentally fit, and you're going to become a United States Army soldier. And I did. You know, I was like, wow, I started learning regulations, and he's like, you need to learn how to lead, you need to do this, you know. So he, he, he groomed me, you know, and he, and he taught me. Um, but after that, I got out of the military, I went to college, uh, finished up school, um, left Kraft Foods. I didn't leave Kraft Foods. I went to a different division, Oscar Mayer Division in Central Missouri, and I was so bored uh, uh, living in Columbia, Missouri. The town wasn't small, but it was a college town. I lived on the out other side from the university. I enrolled in a graduate program. And um, 18 months later, I graduate, get my master's in business, get my MBA. Um, and then I was like, wow, you know, what I'm going to do now? I don't want to be here anymore. Uh, I was having a rough time uh, at the company, uh, some things. It was just, it was a, I don't want to say it was a bad situation, because I did learn something. I learned a lot about myself, restraint. Um, and I knew, I was like, okay, I'm not going anywhere here. I'm not really learning anything. I'm just, I'm just here. Um, and I went to the movies one day, and I tell this story in my workshops. I'm not originally from Florida. And I went to the movies, June 2006, saw this movie. And this is what landed me in Florida. It was a movie with Jamie Foxx, Miami Vice. And I was like, wow. They're doing like that in Florida. You know, I know it's a movie, but you know, in Chicago, South Side of Chicago, and Central Missouri, you don't have no palm trees, you don't have no fast cars like, you know, South Beach. So uh, this was June 2006. August 2006, I'm living in Florida. Uh, I was trying to move to Miami. I thought about moving to Miami. I saw this condo and the prices of downtown, man. I was like, Nah, that's, that's not going to work. So I always share this story when I uh, do workshops. And um, moved to Florida and been here ever since. I uh, worked for an orange juice company. When the housing market went bad, started letting a lot of managers go. Uh, I was probably, like, and they did, it was doing it in phases. So I was like, I don't know, the third, fourth phase or whatever. Uh, and, I, and I was kind of, I was upset the way they did it. But looking back on it now, maybe it was like a blessing in disguise. Uh, I was off work for like a couple of months trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, ended up at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, got hired there as a uh, RVSR rating specialist. Um, RVSR, those are the three names they use. Uh, and I worked there for years rating disability claims. And having that training from the military and working in the private sector, doing process improvement. We all know the government, they don't have that process. They don't use those process improvement methodologies like, say, a Kraft Foods or a Procter & Gamble to increase profit. You don't see that, well, not in the organization or the, uh, the office that I worked out of anyway. You know, there was some process improvement, but not like in the private sector. Um, so it was kind of up and down, but you know, I, I really enjoyed you know, helping vets, educating vets, or learning about the whole disability, VA disability claims process. Go, go through, and then I decided to retire in uh, 2018, and I uh, retired October 26, 2018, at 3.30 p.m. That was my last day. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I was retired maybe about four days, and, and my fiance, she says, you know, what are you going to do? I know you like working out in the yard and cutting grass and all the other stuff, but you don't want to do so much of that. You know, you got to do something else. And I said, man, you know, and people would ask me different questions about the VA disability claims process. And one thing I noticed while working at the VA, veterans weren't being educated. They were just sending in stuff, hoping something would stick. You know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So I decided to... Uh, Start my own business, named the KMD 89 um, Consulting, Leave No Vet Behind. And I was like, I want to educate vets. And so I do local workshops here in Tampa. Um, the business is growing, uh, reaching out 
getting uh, different uh, ideas from other uh, local uh, entrepreneurs and business owners um, and workshops I've created, uh, doing workshops, I'm putting together a module training. Uh, and I think it's very important to educate the veterans on this process so they can be successful in maximizing uh, their benefits. And a lot of people think when I say maximizing is, you know, you can be rated on, from, on a scale from 0% to 100%. I'm not saying you can get the max, which is 100%, but, you know, if you're eligible or you think you're eligible for 50%, then become educated and maximize that. You know, if that's 50% is what you can get, then get it. If, you know, if you've served and you got an honorable discharge and you're able to receive these benefits, then you're entitled to them, get them. But you got to be educated first. And I think that's the big piece. You know, I've been talking about education, my education, and, you know, just gaining that knowledge. And once I gained that knowledge, being trained by the VA, I was like, you know, wow. I was like, man, you know, I want to help other vets to be educated. And I can remember a lady, um, I, won't, I won't say her name, but she was my mentor. And I still ask her questions. You know, she, I think she has 30, uh, is it 30, around 30 years of service. And I mean, she, I mean, her passion to helping vets and educating uh, other VA employees and stuff. And like I said, I still reach out to her if I got a question. And, you know, I think she's coming up for retirement soon. I'm like, hey, you know, I, I want to partner with somebody to put together a curriculum and, you know, do some workshops nationally. You know, when are you retiring? <laughs> you know, when are you retiring? But uh, she was really uh, someone that I could reach out to when I was working as a rating, rating specialist to ask questions. And I mean, she was like a walking VA dictionary. I mean, she would, she would, you know, she would give me crap about calling her asking a question because she was doing her work too, but I would do it anyway, you know. Matter of fact, after this video, I may just call her like, hey, I just did this video and I was talking about you. <laughs> and talking about asking you a question. I just got a question. I'm like, hey, how's your day going, you know? But uh, she was really, I mean, really instrumental in that mentorship. Uh, and that's, and I learned a lot. And what I'm educating Betsy on, she educated me on these same things while working uh, with the VA. So uh, been in business uh, a year, almost a year and a half now. Uh, it's growing, uh, got a lot of clients from Hawaii to the Virgin Islands, all the way to France, you know. Um, and it's, it's uh, I don't wanna say it's weird, but it's, you know, when people call me and now I'm asking them like, how did you hear about me? Oh, well, such and such referred me. Uh, I, one lady said, I saw you on uh, Google, I saw you on Google. Somebody else said, hey, I saw an ad on YouTube. I saw an ad on, not an ad, but uh, one of your YouTube videos. Uh, I saw you on Facebook. And I'm getting more people every day. I, I started a veteran service, a veterans group on Facebook where I post certain blogs, videos, Q&A, stuff that I've done uh, in the local community. People can read, see what I'm doing. And I, I literally, every day, I have one or two people asking to join this group. And what I like from the group is everybody that asks questions, posts certain things, and then we all learn from each other. So everybody that's not, that hasn't been able to maximize their benefits, they can go there and just like a, like a community, like a forum, you know, if you will. Uh, and maybe uh, somebody else had a certain experience and they can share it with the group if they don't mind. And then somebody else may be like, you know, I had that same thing and get that dialogue going. And what are you doing? Well, educating each other. Yeah. The group. What, right. How do people find the group? Sure. Uh, if you go and you Google, not Google, but you go on Facebook, uh, it's KMD 89 uh, VA Claims Consulting is the business page. And from there, you can find a group. The group name is uh, VA Service Connection. We can also find it on your website. Is there a link there? Yes. There's actually a link at the bottom of the website with the, uh, to the Facebook business page. And from there, you can find the group. So the group VA Service Connection. Um, you can uh, search me, Dwayne A. Kimball Sr., um, and then you can send me a request, a friend's request, and you can get there through my uh, personal page, through the group. Uh, so I have some, uh, all my uh, YouTube videos, and also you can go to YouTube, put my name in, Dwayne Kimball, uh, see my face, and I have about four or five, four videos, and just did one yesterday, so be on the lookout What's for that. No bow tie. 
no bow tie. Yeah, that first one I got the bow tie. That brings us up to present day. Mm -hmm. When wow. you're done, when that computer closes, when that call, that phone goes away, you're not spending time with <laughs> your wife and, and, and your son. Uh, Pat, why, why don't you tell them about the Pat? I, I love to exercise. Uh, I have bad knees from the military. I got bad ankles. I got severe flat feet. I got lower back pain. It's ringing in my ears. I get migraines from time to time. But I still love going in the gym and, and doing some type of movements, exercise. And that's, you know, just from young age, growing up in the country, and then we, we didn't have a PS4, you know, we playing tag outside, running, riding bikes, and all this other stuff, and just being energetic, opposed to kids now, they're in front of uh, the TV all day, but um, exercising, I love it. It reduces my stress. I like it. Uh, I'm not trying to become Arnold Schwarzenegger. I just want to maintain a certain level of uh, fitness. fitness. Oh, I'm a long way, man. I, I never saw him in person, but I am a long way from Arnold Schwarzenegger. No guy, they're on a, they're on a totally different level. But uh, what's it do for you? Keeps my stress level down. When I go in, it's like those weights. They, they're just. They just, I don't, don't want to say they're magical, but they just, I've always loved doing it. I, I did CrossFit for a few years, and I went to two different CrossFit locations. The first one, uh, I just kind of like my workouts kind of like stalled. I got to a certain level, and they kind of stalled out. I uh, went to a second one, got re-energized, and then those kind of stalled out a little bit, and then I started getting injured. And I was like, when you get my age, I'll be 51 this month in a couple of weeks. And things don't heal as fast as they used to, it, even if they heal at all. Uh, so uh, my true passion was just lifting, bodybuilding, just in, you know, lifting weights and stuff. And I, I get sometimes where, you know, my mind is telling me, yep, 25, and my body's like, nope, wait, nope, nope, no, 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 don't, you're lying to yourself. But, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, depending on the workouts I'm doing, I throw on my knee braces and back brace or my weight belt, you know, support my back so I don't get that lower back pain. Uh, but that's what I like doing. Uh, I, I rode motorcycles. Um, I have a motorcycle. I rode that a lot when I live in Chicago. I leave the house 10 o'clock at night. We get home like 6 o'clock in the morning, just ride, you know. Uh, hadn't ridden my motorcycle in like a couple of years to just put it in the shop and they call me and say, like, hey, the gas is bad. We got <laughs> we got to drain the gas fuel line. That's bad. It's rusting in the gas tank. I'm like, yeah, just go ahead and fix it because I want to at least ride it back and forth sure, sure. to the gym. But uh, I used to go to Bike Week in South Carolina all the time every year uh, for 13 years straight. Uh, so I had a passion for that. And it kind of faded a little bit. But the gym, the weights, they just they just call me like, you know. Uh, Right, and you know, I've always, you know, in the military, you know, I received an award from this general, General Shinsheki, and he told me, he said, you know, you met the mental part and the physical part, and a lot of people just think, you know, people in the military, they just, it's just all physical, brute strength, and it is, depending on, you know, your job, but I always felt that if I'm physically fit, I can complete any job. Now, the mental aspect of that, if you translate it over to working out, is mentally telling yourself to get up off the couch and do it. And then also mentally telling yourself to continue to do it. You know, nothing is going to stop you. You know, uh, I hurt my shoulder, and like I said, I got... Yeah, I, I, you know, I always had a passion for it, so I just kind of, over the years, just make myself. But when I left CrossFit and I wanted to get back in the gym, 
I hadn't really lifted, like, you know, just going to the gym and lifting has been all CrossFit for like four years. And I was like, man, you know, now I'm starting over again. And I, but I want something to keep me motivated because I'm older now. And I, I went on YouTube and I found this guy, C.T. Fletcher, strongest man you never heard of. He has a documentary on, uh, <laughs> on YouTube. And I wear his wristband. I got one of his wristbands. I had two. Uh, but the, the other one broke. Uh, he always would say, it's still your blanking set. No matter what, it's still your blanking set. And then this one is blank excuses. So I'll look at it, and he has, he talks about, on his videos, he talks about his, his life or his life through weights, you know, weightlifting, you know, being a bodybuilder and all that stuff. And he had, uh, had to replace an aortic valve in his heart. Uh, he had a couple of heart surgeries. I think he just went through a heart transplant, I want to say about a year ago. Uh, but if <laughs> he's like this super personal trainer, I mean, back in the day, he doesn't personal, I don't think he pers does any personal training now, but he uses a lot of colorful language. But when you just listen to him, he's like, what are you doing? You, you sitting on your couch, you complaining, you watching my videos, you comment and telling me what I'm doing wrong, but you sitting at home on the couch. And he had this thing, uh, it's pre-workout. And I'll, it wasn't, I don't think it was real pre-workout. But uh, he has a pre-workout that I use. But this one was, I think it was just, I don't know what he was promoting. But in the bottom, it gave a description. Are you suffering from lazy blank syndrome? <laughs> you know, <laughs> are you workout? So, and I'm like, I'm looking at it, so I, I Snapchat it. I, snaps, I took a snapshot of it. And the guys that I work out with, when they tell me, oh, I'm not going to the gym, I send them that picture. You know, and they look at it and they're like, man, are you kidding? So I get to the gym and then here they come and he's like, yeah, I got your text, you know. But uh, he, uh, he, he, he's a big uh, motivational uh, person and I still watch his, uh, I subscribe to his channel and I still watch his, his videos today. He has some other people that like he tutored and under him and I subscribe um, to their uh, YouTube channels uh, as well because I like a variety. You know, just not going to the gym and doing flat bench, incline, decline, you know, mixing it up. And that keeps, that keeps you motivated as well. And especially the body motivated because you're hitting it from all different, different angles, you know. It helps so. manage your stress. And I think that even if your legs are hurt, if you work on the heart, the pain, I think your body does something to reduce the limitations of other areas. Yeah. Well, I do have, I, I get, I, you know, with me being uh, 50, I still have to take, you know, sometimes it takes my body a little bit more time to, to repair itself, the muscles, uh, you know, especially if I kind of push myself uh, a little bit. But um, that's okay. You know, I just take a couple of days off and then I'll hit it again the following week or, you know, whatever the next training day is. And people are like, oh, man, well, you, you know, your feet and knees, I'm like, are you going to let that stop you? You know, that means because, you know, you got low back pain, you got bad knees, and you see me, I'm shifting because <laughs> my knees are starting to hurt. I got the, the severe flat feet, but I'm not going to let it stop me. That doesn't mean life ends. You know, you look at other people that are, are you know, in wheelchairs. They're, look at the things that they're doing. You know, you, you have veterans, uh, double amputees, they're doing these long bike marathons that I probably could never do, and they're doing it. So, you know, I still, you know, I'm fortunate to have my limbs, so I, I want to do something. I just don't want to sit at home uh, on the couch, you know. I don't want to be uh, someone that, you know, in the military I was fit, and now I'm out of the military, and I just let myself go. I mean, I, I don't knock people for doing that. If someone wants to do it, that's fine. But for me, personally, I, you know, that's, you know, you know I, I want to, you know, I want to maintain a, a certain level of uh, fitness. Last night, I met a, a gentleman, uh, and we did CrossFit together, and 
I won't call his things, but I, I, man, his biceps were always. I'm like, dude, you ought to do a video about your biceps. Biceps by, you know, in his name. And I saw him in the gym. And I was like, man, are you doing crossfit? And he was like, nah. He was like, you know, he got a great beard like me. And he's like, nah. He's like, I just joined here three days ago, and I know you go here. He's like, man, I, I kept waiting on you to come in. And then when you came in, he's like, hey, hey, we're going to work out. So he's real cool. So I'm looking, you know, I said, but well, you got to come work out with me by 839. He's like, cool. He's like, I'm, we're going to start working out together. Another guy I work out with, uh, <clears throat> young guy, I called him young. He's like 39. And, uh, you know, we were working out together about four months. And for me, when I look in the mirror, I, you know, I really don't see uh, a difference, but other people see it. And with him, he's like, man, people were saying, man, I'm getting a little bit more shredded, I'm, you know, bulking up a little bit. And we, we you know, sometimes I, I try and push it probably more than I should. And I come home, my wife, she's like, uh-huh, see? You know? <laughs> and uh, she reminds me, you know, as young as you used to be. And I just have those days where, man, I can't get off the couch. It's not because I'm not motivated. It's either I'm sore. Uh, i got a partial tear of my right shoulder um, that I'm trying to rehab. Um, and it's just my body's in that pain. And so I, I'm like, okay, I don't want to re-injure myself or injure myself even more. So I'm going to have to take that extra day just to recoup, you know. But, your body and, but do what you can. Right, do right, what you can. right. Get, get moving. Get up and uh, get moving. So when I do the business, you know, I'm the same way with my business. I'm, you know. At first, I was just doing it kind of part-time. I had a mentor. I was like, ah, oh, you know, I don't really have to do it. I'm just doing it part-time. And I still do, I, you know. I, I, but I want to make sure that I'm staying current on the VA claims process to make sure I'm giving the correct information uh, to veterans. You know, that's, 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 that's key. So, you know, I, I ch tackle that. The same way I, I may tackle some workouts, you know, I'll get motivated, I'll stay on the computer. I'll just do some research or, you know, answering questions or if I'm on my iPad, you know, before I go to sleep, whatever, laying in bed. And, you know, asking questions uh, to vets and stuff like that. So just making sure, you know, staying on top of my game and providing, you know, up-to-date uh, information and educating as many vets as I can. That's, that, that's the goal. Because I know eventually... I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, so while I am doing it, I want to do it, reach as many people as I can.